the moments that bless his heart the most don't happen in the spotlight. I'm I'm quite certain. I mean, I have yeah. to I have to believe that because mm-hmm. my king in all of his rightful glory doesn't come in as a warrior king riding the latest whatever. He comes as a baby and he spends mm. the majority of his life hidden. I'm Chelsea Amber, a Christian recording artist and the founder of Christian Guitar Girls, an encouraging community for Christian female guitar players and bass players. We are a group of women who are serving our communities through music and developing our skills all for the glory of God. You can find our Facebook group called Christian Guitar Girls Community to connect with other women in music and ministry. And I want to equip women to reach their guitar goals. So I do have a free ebook called the Christian Guitar Girls Practice Plan. It is a downloadable PDF designed to help you not only set your goals, but then actually create an effective plan to reach those goals. And this applies to all skill levels, whether you're a brand new beginner or a seasoned player. So if you're ready to make your practice time more efficient and see progress in your playing, then go to christianguitargirls.com slash practice plan. Now we have a really great episode coming up with my friend, Amy Savin. So let me just read a few things here about Amy. Amy is a dynamic and powerful vocalist and songwriter who crafts melodic alternative rock songs that combine huge sounding guitars and intricately designed drum parts together into explosive declarations. In her latest album, Unveiled, you can hear influences like Paramore and Amanda Cook in songs like It's a Good Life and All We'll See, while her first record is more of a Bethany Dillon-esque roots rock-driven effort. So she lives in the U.S. right now, but she shares dual citizenship between Canada and Australia. And right now she's living in Michigan, where she is a worship pastor at her local church. And I met Amy a number of years ago through the Gospel Music Association of Canada, and On a personal note, I've always felt a certain connection with you, Amy, Um, like we're in this together. We're cheering each other on. You have a lot of depth. You have an infectious love for the Lord. You have the gift of encouragement. So I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you, Chelsea. I hope this feels effortless for you because it is for me just literally getting to talk to a dear friend. So honored to be here. Yeah, and it's fun because I like to pretend that we're just across the table, like having a coffee or a or a drink or whatever. So, what are you drinking? I'm drinking some classy H two O in my Yeti, keeping Excellent. it cold. I've got a coffee drink. I like to call it coffee drink so I don't insult the the coffee connoisseurs because it's it's coffee, but it's the second pressing in an AeroPress, and then it's got a ton of oat milk and maple syrups. <laughs> so it's not like. <laughs> A real coffee, but well, it's, it's coffee inspired. <laughs> let me interrupt you because you never used to drink coffee. No, you were a tea girl. I was tea, all tea, all the time. And then my, you know, my life changed, seasons changed, and I decided that I needed more caffeine in my life. So, <laughs> so I love it. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it. I'd love to know how and when did you start playing guitar? Guitar. Uh, guitar kind of entered into my world in my late teens. Um, I was, I was raised on the piano at age three. Mm. Uh, I was just, I wanted to copy my brother Ryan and everything he did. And Ryan was in piano lessons. So I wanted to do that too. And, mm-hmm. um, but as I became a teenager and, I saw my brother Ryan playing guitar. I was like, I need to do this too. Shout out to you, Ryan. I guess you're my number one inspiration in life. (laughs) Um, Love it. I started writing music and I was tired of asking Ryan to to play songs with me, to do shows with me. So I was like, I'm just going to learn this myself. And so I did. That's great. And you have this, uh, this, I don't want to call it determination or... um... I don't know. You just, you, when you put your mind to something, then you learn how to do it and you do it. When we're going to get to that later, because you've learned how to produce your own music, which I'm excited to talk about, but I've always admired that about you, that you see something and you're like, you know what? I can, I'm just going to get her done and you do it. Yeah. Yeah. That little, I don't know if it's, um, if it's always good, because you can tend to do a lot by yourself when other people could maybe do things better. But I think part of it is just that genuine love for learning 
that mm. that drives me. Like it's interesting to me. So yeah, yeah. thanks, Chelsea. No, you're welcome. Well, I find that seems to hold people back sometimes. Like they're if they are always kind of waiting for someone else to do something for them. And I struggle with that sometimes when it comes to things that are technology based where I think, you know, like, like producing or, or whatever, just kind of getting intimidated by the, the technology, the programs, the software, the hardware. Yeah. Um, so I love that you don't allow yourself to get intimidated by that, but I am getting ahead of myself. No problem. Um, but then you took on the guitar, you started playing, and then eventually you got involved in worship. You became a worship leader and a Christian recording artist. So can you tell me a little bit about that journey? Yeah, I mean, the whole worship leading thing, I, that was not that was not on my radar at all. Hmm. Um, I never wanted to do that. I wanted to just write my own music, share my stories, travel the globe, mm -hmm. and that that was my dream um but the lord just kept bringing me into the realm of worship worship leading and especially here in the US a decade ago when i entered when i immigrated here um worship leading paid positions in canada weren't as common i mm. i don't know what it's like now chelsea because i've not lived there for a decade now but it wasn't a paid position it wasn't like um a career by any means but in the US it was like everywhere. And I guess mm. maybe that's why I hadn't thought about growing up and being a worship pastor. I don't know. The last five years, I mean, the, my whole my whole time here in the U.S. in entering into the world of worship has just totally drastically changed my life. Um, I could, yeah, I could talk for hours about worship. <laughs> yeah. well, I'd love to hear, so you said it changed your life. Like, is there an example or something that you, that comes to mind that you think? Oh man. Yeah. I think even at this, la this church that I'm at, Radiant Church, um, happened upon this church during the pandemic. Hmm. I think I might've shared this in another podcast that you and I were on together, but, uh, cliff note version is I was touring my last project unveiled in the middle of a Western Canada tour. Everything shut down, came back home, had no, no income, you know, cause every single show was canceled. Mm. And a f I guess he was an acquaintance at the time messaged me, asked me if I could fill in to do some online worship for their church. Cause their worship leader had moved out of state just recently and I was like, hey, I'll I'll literally take anything. And yeah. uh, so I was going in Thursday nights and recording worship for them to stream. Um, and anyways, I uh, I was thinking like, yeah, I'll do this for a few months and return return on to the road to tour. And that just never happened. And as it as it is, I just fell in love with what that church, what Radiant Church was going for. And the thing that changed my mm. life, Kelsey, is just this idea of ministering to the heart of God as opposed to simply just ministering to people. Mm. Because if all we do is minister to people, then we turn them into consumers. Mm. And then when things are hard and trials come, well, God has just been this, this being that gives to us what we need. Instead of recognizing that when when uh, trials happen, if I've been ministering to the Lord every day, well, then that doesn't change because my love for him was never about what he could give me. My mm. love for him was always based on he's always been better than what he provides. Mm. He is the treasure. And so I think just this whole idea of ministering the heart of God, even building churches that attract God rather than attracting people. Hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, I feel like if we do the, the former, if we, if we attract the heart of God, if we provide an environment where his spirit wants to rest, I, I know the spirit of God visits every church house, but there are places where he feels so welcome that he would rest hmm. and that he would be vulnerable. and. I think just understanding the the weight and responsibility of pure worship to bless the heart of God, um, the intimacy that comes out of that, the love he he lavishes back on those who have created that resting place for him is tremendous. I mean, that intimacy will will makes every moment worth living. Um, mm. and so that's the kind of 
I don't know, headspace I've been in and been pastored in at a church like Radiant, where that's our goal is to be a praying and worshiping church, a church that houses the presence of God and makes the King feel welcomed. Mm. Um, and that, of course, has influenced mm. my writing and mm. maybe some of my genre that I'm that I'm writing in. But um, yeah, I I love that because I find it maybe in more like Western Christianity uh, that it can become a very much of a consumer thing. Like, oh well, God, I did this for you. Now you owe this to me. And it's like God, God actually doesn't owe us anything. Like he he already gave us so much more than we can even imagine through Jesus. It's like, and yet he still chooses mm -hmm. to, to have that intimate relationship with us day to day uh, and, and be involved in those parts of our lives, lives. But it's, it's not a, he's like, he's not Santa Claus, you know, or whatever, or like, um, I don't know. A vending machine. Or a vending machine. Yeah, he's not a vending machine where you just so like, if I just kind of, you know, press these buttons, then he'll give me what I want. And I'll, right. have, a cor I'll have a Corvette in my yard next week or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it's um, it's putting our focus on, on God rather than on ourselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, I mean, that if, even affects our prayer life too, uh, in terms of how we approach God in just the surrender, you know, like, oh, if God didn't answer a prayer in a way that we <laughs> expected, are we still going to trust him? Are we still going to uh, minister to his heart? Or is it all about what I can get? And I'm going to, you know, head out now, you know? Right. Um, I mean, it's really easy to reduce our relationship with God to something that's very transactional, mm -hmm. and mathematical. I do yes. this, you do that. I do mm -hmm. this, you do that. Um, but that's not his heart. It's like mm -hmm. if if I knew that every time I prayed a certain way, I would get this result, there would be no need for trust, faith, intimacy, like everything's calculated. Mm -hmm. And we have a living, active relationship with God where so many things impact the outcome. And mm -hmm. God doesn't want us to live in that spirit of religion that that associates performance with provision. Mm -hmm. right he provides yeah. because he's good yeah not because we're good because he's mm -hmm. good absolutely which is a countercultural thing to say <laughs> oh yeah so then yeah you became a, a worship leader and obviously was just really drawn into the heart of what was going on in in the church and um the christian recording artist piece of things now that is a very public platform. That's a very public thing to do. You're on social media, you're putting out music, you're doing shows or different events. Um, but then in 2021, you decided to actually take a step back from the public side of music mm -hmm. and stay hidden for the year. And so I'd like to dive into that a little bit. First of all, what inspired that decision? Well, I think a few things. One immediate thing was I was dealing with some really hard things with some really deep grief. And I think to be on the, like, to be public, I mean, essentially, especially the way I try and use social media, I tend to do a lot of pastoring, sharing my thoughts, my journeys in God and encouraging mm -hmm. artists and worship leaders. And so that requires a tremendous amount of thought pouring out for me. Mm -hmm. And then there's the whole creative aspect, of course, that it's a whole nother level of <laughs> social media. Um, but anyways, I just felt like I, I was in a season of needing to receive, mm. receive from my father for, for healing. And then also creatively, I didn't want the distraction of looking at what everybody else was creating and doing and achieving. I didn't need that my life to be filtered through everybody's <laughs> own accomplishments and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, they're highlight reel. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to, to tuck away. And I knew that, and here's the other thing. It's like, even from a, even from a pastoral perspective, sometimes we feel like every revelation the Lord gives us, we need to just let it out as if like, I don't know, we need everybody to know how, uh, how wise we are or, and it's just like, there's so many things the Lord tells me 
And I don't feel like I need to tell anybody. Like, it's just for me, you know, mm-hmm. when someone yeah. else had said this, it's like your friend, your friend confides in you for a full hour. And instead of just receiving and being with her, you just go off and tell five other people. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what if the Lord has things that he wants to just share with you? And, and so I, you know, I'm discerning that whole thing too, with social media is like, why am I sharing? When, when am I sharing? Is this, I really feel like the spirit needs to lead every part of our life, including social media, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Plenty of times where I'm like, no, I'm not sharing this or I'm not participating in this because I don't need to. The, one of the biggest things I learned from that whole year off Chelsea is, uh, nobody, nobody missed me. And I, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, Nobody was missing out that I wasn't sharing. Like no one, I think part of the the trap we can get into is thinking that everybody needs to hear our opinion and everybody needs Mm. to hear what I'm thinking. Mm. (laughs) Everyone has their little soapbox and they have an important, powerful message. And I realized like, no, I, I don't. Unless he tells me to go, unless he tells me to speak, well, then Mm. I don't. Yeah, And my platform for all of 2021 was my family, my church, my community, anybody who was in my immediate sphere of influence now was plenty. And that's mm. beautiful. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, those were, those were kind of the two main reasons why I pulled back. Um, yeah. And then like with fear and trembling, I reentered. I'm like, am I, what am I doing? <laughs> but I think, I think it's possible to have a presence on social media that is guided by the spirit. I feel like most of us don't do it well. Hmm. It's hard to do well. It's so hard to do well. I mean, it's awkward, Chelsea, right? We're like, especially in the realm of if, if all I was doing was maybe uh, like recording artists, creative person, that's one thing. But then you have the whole, like my world is being a worship pastor. So then how do you live in that world where social media tends to be dramatically about, you know, self-promotion? I don't know how to do that. Well, how do you even do it tastefully? And I don't know. (laughs) And my heart goes out to all the independent artists that don't actually have anybody behind them doing all that for them. And Mm -hmm. so we have the burden of trying to promote things and we, no one likes that. I mean, Mm -hmm. you probably hate it. I hate it. Yeah. I, my, my relationship with social media changed dramatically in 2020 and beyond. Like I found since, cause I actually tried with, you know, like, oh, I'm really going to try to this Instagram thing, you know? And, um, I just, I found that with all the all this stuff through the pandemic and then all the social justice things and then being a woman of color on Instagram, I just felt so much pressure Mm. that like I'm trying to process these things that are happening and yet I'm still expected to show up and say something eloquent and agree with certain things or and have certain opinions. And I'm like, I'm still trying to figure this out. And I just like, I, I found it was actually, it was affecting my mental health, like being on social media. And I just, ever since then, I found, I know I do YouTube now because I actually really enjoy that platform. I I really love YouTube. And so I try to put out as much as I can there. Um, But I don't, YouTube doesn't cause a a sense of, I don't know, angst in me or like this pressure the way Instagram does. Uh, And then even also, honestly, Twitter, I just like, I will pop on there just to make sure that nobody tried to message me or something. But inevitably, like all people are mean on Twitter. Oh. So, oh my goodness! Like, what would it what would it look like if we all tried to use social media for the glory of God? What would that look like? It would it would be revolutionary, and I think our and mental health would be a lot better. Mm-hmm. Well, know? Chelsea, you're already doing a lot of that. To be honest, like you have such a beautiful presence online. It's oh, very you. <laughs> very like you're you're like everybody's big sister. Aww, and thanks. you are in in many ways. You are pastoral too. You're always coaching people. Um, I mean, your entire Christian G- Guitar Girls is lifting other musicians up, celebrating women of diversity, especially with with guitar, but mm-hmm. a diverse group of women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like everything you you share has purpose and meaning, and um, 
So I, I actually would look up to you as somebody who's doing it really well. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. <laughs> I probably just, I only post like a couple times a month, but thank you. And I, you I've do. always been, but when I look at your Instagram, I'm like, oh man, she's, she's doing this well. Cause you, you're always encouraging and, um, in lifting people up and pointing them to Jesus rather than to yourself. And I think it's okay. Like if someone has a new song that they want to share to the world, I think that's like, there's a, a certainly a, a place for that. Um, and, but I just, I feel like you, you, you do Instagram well. And I just, I really admire you for that. Like you would be the exception to a lot of the stuff that I see on Instagram and, and Twitter and everything. So thank you for the way you serve through social media. Oh, thanks Chelsea. Yeah. And I think you, you said something important. Um, I think it's not wrong. It's not wrong to, uh, to share I can't, of course it's not wrong to share <laughs> and to announce a record and to promote it. Like, I think the opposite end of the spectrum is true is Christians can just live in this false humility. Like it's no, I can't be on anything. You can't see like, you know, and it's just like, no, we need to, we need to live out, um, our identity with confidence. Like mm -hmm. I need to be able to, to be able to celebrate and appreciate the art that I'm creating. Mm -hmm. I need to do that. If I don't do it, then something's dreadfully wrong. And I'm actually not even enjoying the person I am. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, it's such a fine balance of. Yeah. There's two sides to the coin. two sides. Yeah. Insecurity and pride mm. are both false um, perceptions of ourselves. Yeah. Right. Two horns on the same goat. Yes. Come on. <laughs> what would be an encouraging word that you could offer someone who feels like they are in a hidden season right now, or maybe if they're feeling unseen? I would say to not, um, to not let what you see around you of what's important define what's important to you. We, we, for some reason, associate the platform and the spotlight with important, mm, mm -hmm. but I'm certain we're going to meet Jesus face to face. And the least of these, the people who were unseen, I mean, the, one of the prayers I pray very frequently, actually, it's not even a prayer. It's a question. I say like, Lord, who is the most surrendered person right now? And what are they doing? Mm. And I just, I, I want to visualize that. And I'm like, is it a, is it a little child? Is it a 90 year old grandma? Like who are these people that are so close to your heart that are so deeply surrendered? And mm. I just imagine who that might be. And I'm quite certain <laughs> the moments that bless his heart the most don't happen in the spotlight. Mm. I'm, I'm quite certain. I mean, I have yeah. to, I have to believe that because mm -hmm. my King in all of his rightful glory and uh, status doesn't come in as a warrior king riding the latest whatever. He comes as a baby and he spends mm. the majority of his life hidden. Mm. So if yeah. God himself does not seem to uh, pursue a platform that we think is so cool and important, well, then maybe dare I believe that that's true about my life. And in fact, the palace messed David up. Hmm. David, That's an interesting point. I never thought about that. Oh, yeah. David's best days were in the field, singing mm. songs to his father. Mm. David's best days were when the purity of his worship came tending sheep. Mm. It was the palace that messed him up. So in seasons of hiddenness, don't crave the platform. But just know that like all of life is about being faithful. If he's called you to, yep. to hiddenness, mm -hmm. be hidden. If he's yeah. called you to step out now, encourage, then do that. But yep. there's no season that's better than the other, mm. right? It's just different. And I try yeah. and view it that way. Um, I think we have such an obsession with being seen because we're not, we don't actually know we're seen by him. Mm -hmm. The moment we, we feel seen, not feel, but know that we know that we know that he loves us. Well, then nothing else matters. And I think 
it's so important. Yes, we don't live for the affirmation of man. We live for the affirmation of God. And yet, if you have a community of people that really see you and know you and affirm you, you don't need the 15,000 likes. You don't need mm-hmm. yep. the concert halls to be packed out when you're playing because mm-hmm. you have the affirmation of your family. And that's mm-hmm. very different than affirmation of, of the world, of strangers. Um, those are the things that have kept me grounded. In my season of hiddenness, mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. still really plugged into a community that deeply affirmed me. Brothers, mm-hmm. sisters, mothers, fathers. And I don't mean biologically, even though I would include my biological family in that, but like the staff that I'm a part of, my community here, like they affirm me. And when when your family affirms mm-hmm. you, it's the highest high. Like mm. it's beautiful and it's grounding and it's true. So yeah. I don't it's even also a good reminder for us in community to make sure that we are also providing encouragement to the people yes. in our circles as well. So we had just talked about a season of hiddenness and you had been kind of quiet on the public face for a year. And then you came out guns ablazing <laughs> in the new year. <laughs> with a new song called Like Cargo, which you produced yourself. So what is the production process that you did for that song? Well, the reason I produced it myself was, I mean, we all know how expensive it is to record. And Mm -hmm. I knew that a song like that wasn't something everybody wanted to download into their iPod. Does anybody even use iPods anymore? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I knew it wasn't going to like sell a lot of it, especially with streaming platforms. Um, so I was like, I need to really consider the cost in this and the cheapest option would for me to produce it myself. But mm-hmm. then I thought that, um, what a great opportunity to practice on a song that's pretty simple. And the only things on the song are vocals, like the main vocal, background vocals, and then piano and an orchestra. And that was enough for me to work with. But the thing about production, and and maybe some people don't know this, but Producing your music doesn't mean you're you're necessarily like audio engineering everything and recording everything yourself. You're just collecting mm. all the pieces and putting all the right people together mm. to create this this vision that you have. And and that's how I view music. And and part of it, I am recording myself, like piano and vocals or whatever. Um, but even as and I'm getting ahead of myself as we talk about production further, like. As long as you have the vision for it and you can just bring the right people to carry that out, you have a Mm. producer's ear because you know Mm. all the pieces that need to fit. And for a song that was so gut-wrenching like like Cargo, Mm. I had gone through so many different ideas, like one with like a really epic full band, like starting off mellow and then growing with drums and electric guitars because that's kind of my brand. And then I was like, no, like... If I add all of that, the song is so dark already. Like it would be, it would feel really, really heavy. And so I thought like, what are some elements where I could, could share this message more palatable or make this more palatable? And um, I thought, and also like, what would, what would embellish the story and, and these really earthy things like, vocal cords and strings being like i would liken strings very it just to me reminds me so much of a of a human even just with the vocal Mm. cords it's so Mm. emotional the strings Mm. have so much emotion in them and yet there's just such a a calming beauty about them Mm. and so i thought if i just kept things simple um that maybe would be more powerful and maybe it would be easier to, to handle because I think the orchestra just brings such a, a haunting yet gorgeous aspect to a song that is really painful. So you've alluded to how the song has kind of a, a darker theme to it, a darker subject matter. Would you be able to share with us what the song is about, what inspired it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it was around eight years ago, I watched the the film Taken starring Liam Neeson. Is that his name? And um, yep. it was just, it was so, so impacting. I couldn't believe that human trafficking exists in general, but I think a lot of us have associated sex trafficking with foreign third world countries 
poverty, but it happens here in the U.S. And that whole film depicted that. And I actually, I was shooken up for weeks. And Mm. so I started researching online, like, what are things that we can do as a community to like combat this crime? Um, Ran into the A21 campaign Mm. led by Christine Christine Kane. Yes. Mm -hmm. My Australian sister, Mm -hmm. um, sister in the Lord. And I started advocating for them. Um, And around that time, I had written this song. um, But the the main reason I wrote this song in particular is in my research, I came across someone that was more local to me, Teresa Flores, a sex trafficking survivor based Mm -hmm. out of Detroit. And her story, The Slave Across the Street, was just absolutely gut wrenching, and I I don't think before her novel I had the language to to write a song like this. Like just reading her story just gave me all the right words, and there were several times I had to put it down because it was just devastating to my soul. Like hmm. it was devastating, and um, I mean even anybody who's who's fighting this crime and learning all of the statistics, like you have to take it in small amounts and really ask the Lord for his provision. Cause it is so dark, Chelsea. It is so Mm. dark. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyways, I wrote this song eight years ago and I've always wanted to release Mm. and record it, but, um, it was never the right time. And yeah, I just, for whatever reason, the Lord opened up some over opportunities for me to, to record and release it this past year or January. Um, And it's provided really incredible opportunities. I've actually now collaborated with Teresa Flores on several Mm. occasions to do events with her. I have one coming up in the fall. Actually, she doesn't even know about this one yet, but I know she'll do it. Um, Because there's a church here that wants me to invite uh, her her, uh, organization, SOAP, Save Our Adolescents from Prostitution. She goes into hotels Mm. and she distributes SOAP with a human trafficking hotline because girls that are trafficked through those hotels, they have to reach them in a very discreet way. And so Mm. um, they've, they've rescued quite a few girls just from those numbers. And so part of her her, uh, organization distributes that. I just got chills from you saying that. It's amazing. Yeah. So that's the story behind that song. Mm Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. And if uh, I want to encourage everyone to check out this song, it's called Like Cargo by Amy Savin. So where can people find you and your music online? Anywhere you stream music. Um, I mean, I have CDs. Come on, you guys. Just order some hard copy CDs. <laughs> yeah. those, mm-hmm. will, those will make a debut just like the record did. <laughs> the, mm. the vinyl. Um, but yeah, anywhere, anywhere online, uh, amysavin.com has all of the, the links. So you don't have to go Googling anywhere. Excellent. Well, we'll leave links to that in the description so that people can check out your new song and connect with you online. I just want to thank you so much for sharing your journey, your musical journey. And then, you know, what God has taught you through these years with music and worship leadership and production and everything. Um, I was, it was a really great conversation. So thank you for that. Well, thanks for having me, Chelsea. I am super proud of you for even creating this podcast and for engaging in this conversation. This has been a dream on your heart for a while. Mm -hmm. And to see you doing it and to get to participate is just such a gift. So thank you. Uh, Thank you. Well, I appreciate you so much. And to all our listeners, if you enjoyed this chat, there are many more to come. So make sure to hit that follow or subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to visit christianguitargirls.com slash practice plan to get your copy of the free ebook to help you start crushing those guitar goals. I'll leave a link for that in the description. And also a reminder to check out those links that I'll leave for Amy Savin and her music. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll catch you in the next episode. And until then, happy strumming. Are you singing? Are you singing for Amy?